Let us pray. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when you were given up to the will of your persecutors, suffered many torments when they took off the purple robe, which was stuck to your wounds, and put upon you your own clothes. Grant that after I have put off the clothing of this body, I may be clad with the robe of perfect charity, and that I may be adorned with your merit, and through your mercy be introduced as an adopted son into the heavenly inheritance. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who in the midst of reproach and injury bore your cross with excessive pain on your sacred and cut shoulders. Wearied and panting for breath, you toiled exceedingly under its heavy weight. Give me grace to take hold of the cross of self-denial with ardent devotion, and to imitate with the most fervent of charity the example of your virtues, and to follow you in humility even unto death. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when you were led from the city with two thieves, did not refuse to be pressed upon and thrust hastened, and to be afflicted in many ways. Draw me after you, that I may quickly follow. Grant that for your sake I may entirely deny, forsake, and go out of myself. Give me grace to think of you alone, and to find no joy except in you, my Redeemer. Grant that I may love you alone, and may return love for love. May I earnestly seek after you, and live to you alone. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when bowed down by the weight of your cross, at length reached the place of punishment, where, offered e quite exhausted, they offered you wine mingled with gall. May you extinguish in me all gluttonous and carnal desire, giving me grace never to consent to any impure or unlawful pleasure but may I take my food in moderation to the glory of your name, and may hunger and thirst after you alone, and find no pleasure or gladness except in you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who was stripped before the gaze of all people on Mount Calvary, and the soreness of your wounds being increased by the removal of your clothing. You did not refuse to undergo for my sake the most dreadful pain. Grant that I may love the spirit of poverty and never be disturbed by want or scarcity. Give me grace to bear patiently any difficulties or troubles in this life for the glory of your name. Strip my heart of every vain fancy and affection and grant me a holy intent with pious desires, renewing within me daily a most pure love for yourself. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who gave himself up to be extended naked upon the wood of the cross and the joints of your most holy limbs to be wrenched apart, most cruelly nailed and fastened thereto. Then for my sake you suffered your most delicate hands and feet to be most deeply wounded. Grant, O Lord, that I might remember with a faithful and grateful heart, this your unspeakable charity, when you did of your own accord stretch out your hands to be bored and your feet to be pierced through. O Lord, enlarge and extend my heart by a perfect love of you. Pierce it and fix it to yourself with the nail of your sweetest love, and shut up within yourself alone all my senses, all my thoughts and all my affections. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall sing your praise.
A reading from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 22. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan asked to have all of you, that he might sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith would not fail. You, when once you have turned again, establish your brothers. He said to them, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will by no means crow today until you deny that you know me three times. He said to them, When I sent you out with that purse and wallet and shoes, did you lack for anything? They said, Nothing. Then he said to them, But now whoever has a purse, let him take it, and likewise a wallet. Whoever has none, let him sell his cloak and buy a sword. For I tell you that this is what is written must be fulfilled in me. He was counted with transgressors. For that which concerns me has an end. They said to him, Lord, behold, look, there are two swords. He said to them, that is enough. And they went out, as his custom was, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. When he was at that place, he said to them, Pray that you do not enter into temptation. He withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he rose up from his prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of grief and said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. While he was still speaking, behold a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He came near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Then when those who were around him saw what was about to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? The certain one of them struck the servants of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered, Let me at least do this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple and elders who had come out against him, Have you come out as us against us as a robber? with swords and clubs. When I was with you in the temple daily, didn't you, you didn't stretch out your hands against me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. They seized him and led him away and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed from a distance. And when they had kindled the fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat among them. A certain servant girl saw him as he sat in the light, and looking intently at him said, This man also was with him. He denied Jesus, saying, Woman, I do not know him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. These words contain a warning, a comforting assurance, and the most solemn charge. So let us consider first the warning. We must remember that the word you is not used here in the sense of our common language, that is to express a single person. Our Lord does not say that Satan had desired to have Peter only, but all the apostles. The hour was coming when their faith would be severely tried, when they were to be sifted as wheat, to see what in them was good corn and what was rubbish. In our lives also, the words can never be otherwise than true. The comforting assurance was 
I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. This is spoken of Peter in particular. For it is, I have prayed for you, in the singular, not I have prayed for you collectively. But though these words speak of Peter only, yet we also have the assurance that it is true also of us. On that very evening, when he had declared that he had prayed for Peter, we know that he prayed for the other apostles too, and not for them only, but also for us. We are also warned of the coming danger, but one is especially prayed for, that being converted himself, he might strengthen his brethren. These words were addressed to Peter, and if we might read the first twelve chapters of the Acts, we shall see in them their fulfilment. There we find him indeed, being the strength of his brethren, passing through all quarters and by signs and wonders by the words of wisdom, by fervent boldness and love, unfeigned, convincing the unbelievers, opening the eyes of the ignorant, baffling the threats of the enemy, enlightening, cheering and comforting his fellow brothers and sisters. But this was also said not to Peter only, but also to us. In every society there are those like him to whom it may be said, when you are converted, strengthen your brothers and sisters. There are, and always must be, some who have more influence than their neighbours. Every advantage which we have over others makes us subject to this charge. If we are older, we should strengthen the younger. If we have the ascendancy given by strength and activity, by decision of character, or by general ability, or by consideration of whatever sort, then we, being converted, should strengthen also our brethren. We are answerable not for our souls only, but also to a certain extent those of others. In this world of sin and sorrow, we have our work to do. And the question is, what work is it and how do we do it? Let us take the world of sin and plainly and practically, with earnest consideration, ask what we can and what we ought to do. On all sides of us, we see life blighted and ruined by human passion, which sweep across the earth like a flame over a dry heap, and leave it black and scarred behind them. The sorrows of the world are in the sad heritage of its sins, and these bitter fruits of sin have their bitter roots in selfishness. Things are as they are, and this is the world of sin. We may not leave it. We are where God has placed us, and there we must stay, until he gives us the signal to fall out of the ranks. How can we make better this ruined world of sin? The answer is simple, but stringent, rigid and inexorable. That is, we can only begin to do it by personal innocence and by personal holiness. But how many of us will stumble in this entrance? No man who is not sincere in self-amelioration can never be a prophet of God. Men who have begun wickedly have indeed sometimes, like St. Augustine, like Bunyan, went Whitfield, turned over a new leaf and begun a new life. But we do not believe that even these have done as much as they might otherwise have done. Even as he builds better, who builds upon a foundation, than he who builds upon ruin. But this, at any rate, is certain that no hypocrite, no bad or insincere man can heal in any appreciable degree the sinfulness of anything. Not until he is converted can he strengthen his brethren. However, even when he is converted, he may find that he is maimed, that he has ruined his own transcendent powers of usefulness. And the mere presence and person of good men may hang a charm by the spell of good, which make them do good even though they are not consciously thinking of doing good at all. Their very presence does good, as if there were an angel there, and from their mere silence there spreads an influence, a flowing in of higher motives and purer thoughts into the souls of men. So too the mere presence of bad men makes us bad when they are not thinking of doing harm. 
Marguerite asked Faust, with surprise, how is it she finds herself unable to pray when his friend is by? How many a crime has been consummated solely because of vicious wickedness unconsciously made plastic by the stronger wickedness? Among the pure and the good, the base and the impure inspire a shuddering repulsion, such as the presence of Judas Iscariot seems to have inspired in the heart of St. John. But among the many who are but the weakly bad, the contagion of the stronger bad has an assimilating force. Are we noble enough to enter into the meaning of the sigh of Jesus and to share his pure and divine passion for the world? If so, we must enter also into the spirit of his life. And the very first condition of doing that is sincerity. A sincerity which can only be shown in the wholehearted effort after personal innocence and personal holiness. If we would do as Jesus did, we must be his servants. If we would help to heal the acknowledged evils of the world, we must ourselves be free from them. If we are to tend the plague stricken, there must not be the plague spot on our own heart. He who would help others must not only show others, but lead the way. And the final part of this text expresses a deep mystery of which we should try to give some account. It is a mystery, but what reason can be assigned for this intensity of suffering? Was the anticipation of that which awaited him desertion, ignominy, a death of torture, enough to cause all the agony which he felt? Do we not degrade our perception of Jesus Christ by admitting even the sufficiency to say nothing of the truth of such an explanation? Many an ancient Stoic, many a Christian martyr would have met, or has met, such a fate with a smile upon his face. Shall we place Christ below them on the moral scale? It is, I believe, for the purposes of avoiding this difficulty that theories have been invented in which some new and mysterious element in the suffering of Christ has been introduced. So we are told, for example, that the bitterness of Christ's suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane consisted of some mysterious way in which he had to endure the wrath of God. Of this theory, there is no hesitation in saying it is distinctly immoral, for it represents God, the judge of all the earth, as so far from doing right that he is angry with an innocent being. While we may not presume to be dogmatic about the feelings which passed through his mind then, it is, after all, a fair subject for inquiry. Is there any insurmountable difficulty in ascribing the agony in the garden to a feeling that must have passed through his mind, anticipation of that which, as we now know, and he knew then, awaited him? Insensibility does, to some extent, the work of fortitude. But fortitude cannot do the work of insensibility. Insensibility may make action easier, but fortitude cannot make suffering less. Pain or sorrow cannot turn a brave man from his course, but unless he is insensible as well as brave, he must feel it. It is to the sensitive, imaginative nature that suffering felt or anticipated is truly the most bitter. Such a man needs more fortitude than one who is less finely organised. But to say that because he is more finely organised he is less brave is to assume that that for which neither reason nor fact give the slightest warrant. That it is difficult, perhaps even impossible, to understand the connection between the suffering of Christ and the fulfilment of sin is undeniable. But if this connection is admitted, I cannot see there is any difficulty in understanding why anticipated suffering should have caused such a sharper pang in him than it would have done to many an ordinary man. It is a mistake to confound his sensitivity 
with a deficiency in fortitude. But the conclusion arrived at is quite independent of the relative esteem which you may hold of the stoical and, ins and the sensitive nature. You may call the for former the higher nature, if you like, but it would not have been suited to the mission of Christ. Let us pray. Grant, we beseech you, merciful Lord, to your faithful people pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.